So in this video, I'm going to give you an overview of the Raspberry Pi. And the Raspberry Pi is a £30 computer, which is basically the size of a credit card. You can plug it straight into your TV using the HDMI socket on board. And it was primarily released to aid children in learning programming. So for £30, obviously, you've got a fully fledged functional computer, which you can get up and running with very, very quickly. It's built by the Raspberry Pi Foundation, uh, which is a charity, and they actually sell it in US dollars, although obviously wherever you buy it in the UK, you're paying pounds, and they do that primarily because of the cost of components that fluctuates, and because they're a charity, they can't afford to, to lose money on that sort of things. You can buy it from places like RS Components and Farnell, but there are other vendors that sell it as well. So for example, PC World will sell it, but expect to pay a few pounds more. I've actually used a company called ModMyPi.com, and the benefit of buying from some of these other places is that they do tend to sell a very large variety of accessories such as cases, keyboards, etc. So it's worthwhile looking at some of those. So what can you actually do with this thing? Well, you can run operating systems like Linux. There's various flavors of that operating system that uh, you can run. And they're nowadays quite similar to Windows in the fact that uh, you've got a graphical interface, you use a mouse, uh, many of the keyboard shortcuts work even. As I said earlier, it's designed to help people to learn to program, and there's various programming languages that you can use on it, which I'll come on to uh, very shortly. And you can also use it as a media center, and it's quite good because you can put this thing either you know, by or behind your TV, uh, and this thing can stream content from all over your house and even over the internet. There's programs such as Sonic Pi, which allow you to write music with code. And because of the GPIO, which is the General Purpose Input Output Connections, you can see in the top right hand side of that board behind these bullet points, you can con connect to and control other devices as well. You can even play Minecraft on it. If you download the Raspbian operating system, which I'll cover shortly, uh, there is a version of Minecraft. It's not particularly powerful, but it does play and it, it plays reasonably well, certainly on the Pi 3 that I've tested on. What can't you do with it? Well, you can't really run something like Windows on there, although there is a version of Windows called Windows 10 IoT, which stands for Internet of Things, uh, and that's free of charge. You don't expect to run high-powered apps on this, so you can't run things like video editing, etc. Or if you do, they're going to run pretty slowly. What do you expect for a sub £30 computer? And don't expect to play any really high-end 3D games at any sort of decent resolution. You know, this is not a PlayStation 4 or an Xbox. How do you program with it? There's two languages that are at the fore for programming, and one of them is Scratch, which is a very colourful visual programming language, and you literally drag and drop commands and snap them together, a bit like a jigsaw. So you can see this example on the left has got, in basic terms, you'd call it a for next loop, where it's repeating something 10 times. And on the right hand side, you can see some code written in a language called Python, which obviously is a more text based language, uh, more for serious programming. So what do you need to run a Raspberry Pi? Well, firstly, obviously, you need a Pi itself. And there's been various flavors of the device since 2012 when it was launched. The Raspberry Pi 3 came out in 2016, as well as the Raspberry Pi Zero, and that sells for a phenomenal four pounds. The difference between the Pi and the Pi Zero is obviously the size and the number of connectors that are on there. The processor and the amount of RAM on there is reduced as well. So the processor is the same sort of speed as the Raspberry Pi original back in 2012. But if you're not looking to run anything graphical, like Raspbian or Ubuntu, and you just want it for a specific task, then for four pounds, it's an excellent base. The next thing you're going to need is a micro SD card. And you can pick up an eight gig one on eBay or something like that for about three pounds. I would recommend actually, if you're serious about playing around with the Pi, you might as well buy two, three or four of these because you could have Raspbian installed on one, you could have the Kodi Media Center installed on another, and you can simply swap these around and play around with them. And at three pounds, it's, it's quite disposable. Next thing you need is a standard USB keyboard. I personally opted for a little wireless keyboard, which is uh, under 20 pounds. You get a wireless dongle and this thing fits in the palm of your hand. So if you're using this plugged into your main TV, it's quite nice to sit on the sofa with something that isn't a full size keyboard. But if you're looking to do some serious programming, then you really do want a full size keyboard and mouse, but they can both be picked up pretty cheaply. You'll need a HDMI cable to plug into your TV or monitor. And to be honest, I wouldn't recommend spending a great deal of money on these. 
Finally, you'll need a micro USB power supply and one that charges any Android mobile phone should do the job quite well. Note that not all USB chargers are the same and you really need about 2.1 amps output on this for it to drive it. And also, if you're plugging in external devices into the USB uh, slot of the Raspberry Pi, try and make sure they're powered devices rather than plugging in a USB hub that is then going to power various other devices. Because if you don't have a decent USB power supply into your Raspberry Pi, it's not going to have enough voltage to power everything else. You can also buy a case for your Raspberry Pi uh, just to protect it because obviously it is quite exposed and if you accidentally drop something metal on there while it's powered on then you could short something out. You can pick up a case for about £5 and uh, you can see a case here that I paid about £7 for and this protects the Raspberry Pi rather well and still allows the CPU to be cooled. There are various other options available for the Pi as well. Uh, you can see for example the 8 megapixel camera that was launched in 2016 bottom left hand side of the uh, screen here and that's connected to the Pi via the ribbon cable onto a dedicated camera socket on the Pi. Top right you can see what's known as a hat and that's a hardware attached on top device and these extend the functionality this particular one here is a, a mini piano keyboard and there's drum machines and all sorts of things that you can get as well you can plug in external displays and all manner of different things. And this is an example here of uh, one of the more extreme and expensive accessories. This is the Pi Top computer, which gives you uh, an LCD screen, a battery, full-size keyboard, a trackpad, and all manner of things. And it essentially turns it into a fully-fledged laptop. But of course, at £190, you could actually buy an entry-level Windows machine for that. So it really depends on what you want to do. So what have people done with the Pi? Here's a few examples of various projects that are out there, starting with the Microwave. And this has got uh, voice control. You can speak to it like Siri. It can scan barcodes on packaging and then uh, from a database it can work out how long to cook food for. You can access it remotely by a web-based interface and it can even tweet when it's done. Here's the Pirate Radio, uh, which is effectively an FM transmitter. But do note this is illegal at certain frequencies. And this is my favourite actually, the, um, the Magic Mirror. And it's essentially a one-way mirror with an LCD monitor behind it. And you can show anything from weather, time, dates, headlines, that sort of thing. So that's pretty cool as well. Someone's built a quadcopter with this, which is semi-autonomous, so it can follow you around, that sort of thing. And we have here something that's reminiscent of my childhood, which is the Big Track robot. Uh, this one's called Bert, Boxy Unintelligent Robot with Tracks. And this is built with a Raspberry Pi Zero that you can see on the top there. And someone's using a remote control to control it, uh, which I believe is done via Bluetooth. Someone's actually built a replica of some of the 80s arcade machines. They've actually used a 5-inch CRT, not LCD, monitor here. And they've 3D printed some of the controls. The Fish Pie project is a marine unmanned surface vessel that can actually cross the Atlantic. So this thing is about 300 millimetres long. And uh, it can autonomously navigate the Atlantic, which is pretty impressive. Next up, we have the Pi in the Sky, and I think this has been covered quite a lot in the media. People are attaching Raspberry Pis to helium balloons uh, with a GPS tracker, and they launch this thing up to 39,000 metres. And there you can take photos which clearly show the curvature of the Earth. Once the helium balloons pop, this thing comes hurtling back to Earth, and you can collect it and locate it using the GPS tracker. This was on Kickstarter, and this is a hybrid tube amp to give you that original valve amplifier sound. And this uses the hardware attached on top philosophy, and you can see there in the picture with the Raspberry Pi underneath. There's also various projects where people have linked Apple HomeKit to a Raspberry Pi. I've seen a colleague of mine connect his iPhone to a Raspberry Pi and enable a light switch just using his phone. Tim Peake actually took a Raspberry Pi up to the International Space Station and there was a competition for young programmers to write an MP3 player and also to write music using the Sonic Pi. So let's take a look at what you have to do to install the operating system onto a Pi. Now you can't actually install it directly. You have to use a computer of some description to format the micro SD card and to get the operating system on there. And there's a variety of different operating systems that are available. The most popular is a system called Noobs, and that's not an operating system in itself as such. It's really an installation platform. And the most popular that people install is Raspbian, which is a version of a Linux operating system called Debian. 
It's quite lightweight, so it's reasonably fast on the relatively lightweight power system of the Raspberry Pi, comparing that to a fully fledged PC. And there are other operating systems available as well, such as Ubuntu Mate, Snappy Ubuntu, Windows IoT, as I mentioned before, and OSMC and OpenELEC are actually, they're two different Linux operating systems, but the front end is a system called Kodi, and these are media centers. I'm going to cover Kodi in a little bit more detail later, but really you should just do some research as to which one is the uh, best one for your particular need. And there's other systems like PyNet, RISC, and the Weather Station operating system as well that you can download. And all of these are free of charge. So we're going to take a look at installing Noobs onto a memory card. And that will allow us to install the Raspbian operating system. So you start off by going to the Raspberry Pi website. And you can see the download page here. And there's two versions that you can grab. One is the full network install of Noobs, and that includes the latest version of Raspbian. The Noobs Lite requires you to have an internet connection on your Raspberry Pi, and you'll see why in a second. Noobs stands for new out-of-the-box software, by the way. So once you've downloaded your chosen zip file, all you have to do is unzip the file or decompress it, and then literally open up a, an Explorer window and drag and drop the contents over to your SD card. Now, if you've used your SD card in some other device and it's not showing the full capacity, and maybe you've got an 8-gig card and it's only showing a couple of hundred megabytes, you might need to download a tool called SD Formatter to properly erase the card and reformat it to its original capacity. Next, insert your micro SD card into the Raspberry Pi and then plug in the HDMI cable. Plug in your USB keyboard and mouse and then you're ready to power up your Pi. And you should always do that last because the Pi doesn't have an on-off switch. So the on-off switch is you plugging it in. Once you've powered your Pi up, you should see a screen like the one on the left come up on the screen. And you'll see that this is the, the full version and it's given me the option of installing Raspbian. If we'd gone for Noobs Lite, it wouldn't list anything there until we connected to a Wi-Fi network. So you can press W or click on the Wi-Fi network icon using the mouse and then enter your password for the selected Wi-Fi network. Once you've done that, you will see a variety of other operating systems appear. And then check the checkbox to the left of the one you want to install, and then click on Install. So we're going to select Raspbian at this point. And then once you click on Install, go and make a cup of tea, because it's going to take about 20 minutes or so to install the operating system. Once it's done, you'll be prompted to reboot and then after a rather scary looking screen of text whizzing up the screen, you'll be dropped straight into the graphical user interface. Now, unfortunately, I couldn't actually take some video of the user interface itself, so I've taken a series of screenshots. And what you can see here, at the top of the screen, you've got the menu bar, and it's not dissimilar to the Windows Start menu, to be honest. You've got a variety of submenus. You can navigate it using either the mouse or the arrow keys on the keyboard. The command key or the Windows key on the keyboard brings up the menu. Um, so it works pretty much the same way. In fact, many of the shortcuts that you use in Windows or on the Mac will work the same way. Control and C, Control and V for copy and paste all work the same. On this particular screen, you can see that I've got LibreOffice Writer on the right hand side, which is a open source and free alternative to Microsoft Office, and it's compatible with Office as well. And on the left, you can see the Banshee music player, which I'll show you in a second. And that's pretty similar to Windows Media Player or iTunes. So here's Banshee in a little bit more detail. You can see that I've copied a few MP3 files over. And on the left-hand side, you've got the usual sort of now plan, uh, a queue, various filters such as favorites, recently added, recently played, etc. And there's links to online stores as well. Here you can see LibreOffice Calc which is the alternative to Microsoft Excel. And it's pretty fully functional, a good alternative. It will read and write Excel files as well. And there is actually a full comparison of the features that are and are not available in LibreOffice in comparison to Microsoft Office. There are, in fact, a number of features in LibreOffice that Microsoft Office doesn't actually have. So you might want to take a look and compare them. And also, this particular presentation, I ran this off a of Raspberry Pi at a recent seminar. So you know, it's pretty powerful. It can be used as a full alternative to a normal PC for basic office tasks. Next, I want to briefly talk about Kodi. And as I mentioned before, you can install this using either OpenELEC 
or the OSMC, which is Open Source Media Center. And Kodi is an alternative to something like the Windows Media Center, which was discontinued with Windows 10. And it gives you access to all of your videos, all of your music, pictures, etc. And there's various programs that you can add on as well. It will very easily connect to your Windows network. So if you've got a folder full of, say, home movies, you could stream them wirelessly over your network and bring them up on your main TV screen. So it's a fantastic way to bring all that media together and access it very, very easily. Installing Kodi is very, very easy. You could have done it through Noobs, but what I'm going to do here is show you the alternative method using the downloader, which you can get from osmc.tv. So on this screenshot here, you can see the various devices that it supports, various Raspberry Pi iterations, the Vero and Apple TV boxes as well, but only the first generation of Apple TV. And the next stage is to download it for the operating system that you're going to install it from. And as with Raspbian, you can't install this directly onto the Pi. You have to install it onto a card and then plug the card into the Pi. So I was on a Windows PC, so I clicked on the Windows icon. It downloaded uh, an installer. And when I run that installer, it takes me through a variety of screens, very simple, which we're going to cover now. So firstly, you select your language from the drop down, and then you select what sort of device that you want to install it on. Click on the next arrow and then select the version. And to be honest, you're always going to want to select the top one. Next, specify where you want to install it. And it's probably going to be on an SD card that you're connecting to the computer. And then finally, select your wired or wireless connection. Then click on the device in the window there. It's probably going to be the only one listed there. And then click on the next, and it will install it to your SD card. Installation only takes a couple of minutes or so. And once it's done, you're ready to plug that card straight into your Raspberry Pi and power it up. From there, you have a pretty simple setup screen that just asks you to specify things like the country and time zone that you're in. And then you're taken straight into the Kodi interface, which you can navigate literally using the arrow keys or a mouse. You can also install Kodi on other systems as well. So for example, if you wanted to play around with it on your PC or a Mac before you installed it onto a Pi, you can download it for that operating system and uh, just run it as exactly the same format as if it was on the Pi. The only systems that you can't run it on easily are iOS devices like iPads and iPhones, unless you've jailbroken it, which I personally wouldn't recommend. But other than that, it runs on pretty much any platform that's out there. So if you want to find out more information, where can you go? The first place I'd recommend would be the Magpie magazine, which is actually written by enthusiasts for enthusiasts. And you can find this in most news agents at £5.99, with all the proceeds going to the Raspberry Pi Charitable Foundation. But alternatively, you can actually download it for free as a PDF from the raspberrypi.org website. So just go to raspberrypi.org slash magpie and you can grab it there free. And it's actually a very professionally produced magazine. There's some very, very good content in there. Good examples of different things that people have done with their Pi and downloadable snippets of programs as well. So it really is the first place that you want to go to get up to date information and see what you can do with the Raspberry Pi. Finally, there is actually a Raspberry Pi emulator which will run the Debian operating system. This is not exactly the same as Raspbian, but it's very, very similar. It's what uh, Raspbian is based on. So if you did want to have a play around with that, then you can actually run it in a window on a PC for free straight away. Just go to the website that's on screen now and you can grab it. I did find that it, it ran very, very slow, but if you just want to have a quick play around, then it's a good way to dip your toe in the water. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. Do leave any comments, suggestions or ideas in the comments below.